This is Drive and I'm Jim Farley. My next guest answers a question that I've been asking myself literally for decades. So I've been studying Texans and trucks for like 30 years and I still can't figure it out. Could you demystify Texas and trucks versus cars? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So a truck in Texas, for me and for so many others, means freedom on many levels. My guest is a very famous and accomplished actor and writer and Texan, Matthew McConaughey. Meaning, yeah, I'm going on road, but if I need to get off road, I can go there too. It means I got all my gear. This is more than, I don't need an office. This is my office. And that's what a truck represents. I would always customize my oh, really? my truck, whether I was a... Uh, um, whittling balsa wood handle to fit my hand on the stick shift or whether I'd take out the console and customize the console or have a secret compartment down beneath that I could unscrew <laughs> or the cut back to the back bed. The utility of a truck, the practicality of a truck is very, very, I don't know, maybe there's a better word for it. It's very sexy to us Texans. To be that <laughs> practical and to have your necessaries is like, I'm set. And if I get, if you, if you don't have to depend on other people, you're independent. In, there's an independence or that freedom that for comes. Everything. If somebody needs help, I'm probably the guy. If I need help, well, I got all I need right here. Do you write a journal? I've been listening to your stories and they're so vivid and so specific. And I was like, how does he have such a clear idea of what happened or what was going to happen or what could happen? I'll write. In the moment, if I'm around the table or the campfire or Christmas and a story comes up from one of the family members, which most of the good ones do, in the moment, I'll, I'll pull out I'll pull out my phone and go to notes and jot down the basics, the bullet points of that story. And the family all knows now that when I pull out my journal at the dinner table, mm -hmm. I'm not being rude. I'm not calling anyone else. I'm taking a note. What usually you I'll go like, hey, yeah. Jim. Look what I just wrote. Did you say that? Yeah, yeah, and you'll yeah. go, yeah, I did. Yeah. And all right, Jim Farley. Uh -huh. I'll have it in my notes. And at the end of each month, when I go download my notes from that month, I'll go into that and deconstruct some more details of that story. And what I'll do over that month, though, is I'll try and tell, tell somebody that story a few times. I see. So it gets in there. So I'm practicing yep. the performance of the telling, and I start to see, see what lands and what doesn't. Is storytelling something that is like a thing in your family? Because that's very interesting. It's it's something that you work with, like you work with the story and you try to make it better, but also refine it and also put in your own words and context. How did you learn that? Or is that something that you, that's you? I think I learned it from dinner tables in my, in my house growing up. My dad's a great bullshit great storyteller. My oldest brother's a great, maybe even better storyteller. Middle brother's got his own. He's not the greatest storyteller, but he does probably the most things that have, are, the, are worth telling the story about. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and so yeah. as, as the youngest, that's good. when I would sit at the table and we had that lazy Susan and here went the chatter of the story of yesterday or who ran in today or something, I was always listening keenly and enthralled in these stories. Uh, and then as okay. I got older, I have something in my own life. Right. I was like, I'm going to find a gap at tonight's dinner and I'm going to interject I, and I'm going to get my story. I put it story. in, yeah. And trust me, the first 10 times that I tried, once I got the gap and the stage was on me, I got stage fright yeah. and bogeyed and fumbled through the story. And my family didn't mm -hmm. wait on you to go like, no, go ahead, pick it back up. <laughs> if, you, if you had a, uh, uh, they just went, and pick back up their stories and you were drowned out. So I worked on it to try and get my story in and then eventually had a few successful stories that drew a few laughs or made my family go, oh, wow, I have follow-up questions. And then I started to get the confidence to go, well, if you got a story, you better have a good story. You better know how to land a punchline. You better keep mm -hmm. the listener engaged. Yep. Um, and it's just, we verbally, I think it's the verbal storytelling around the, around the dinner table is where I learned it. You have had a lot of different jobs. I was super impressed with your diversity of the things you've done with your life. Well, look, I think it's all under the umbrella of storytelling. Where did all right, all right, all right come from? Yeah. Because that's got to be a damn good story. It is a damn good story, <laughs> I'll tell you. Those are the first three words I ever said on screen. Summer of 92, okay. Austin, Texas. I go out on a Thursday night to the bar at the top of the Hyatt 
my girlfriend, because I know the guy behind the bar is in my film class and he'll give me free vodka and tonic. <laughs> I head in there. I sit down and order one. He says, Matthew, there's a guy at the end of the bar over here. He's in town producing a film. I go down and introduce myself to that guy. His name's Don Phillips. Don's in town. He's casting this film. What are you doing? He's casting this film. I produced a bunch of movies and cast Fast Times, Ridge Mile High. Anyway, we get to talking. Bach and Tonics go down. We are now standing up, acting out shots we've taken on similar golf courses that we've played in our life. And we're hooting and hollering. And it's we're rowdy enough that we get kicked out of the bar at two. <laughs> okay. He and I are getting along so he decides he'll ride with me on the way home to drop me off at my apartment. He rolls one up. We have a great time. We're yeah. sticking and we're laughing. And all of a sudden he goes, hey, Matthew, you ever done any acting? And I go, well, Don, I was in a Miller Lite commercial for about bleep, that long. It was more of a modeling job than an acting job. He goes, well, you know what? Come to this address tomorrow morning at 930. Now, by this time, 930 is like four hours away. He's like, <laughs> yeah, I got a script for you. There's a character named Wooderson. You might be just right for it. Well, I go home, get a couple hours sleep, go to that address, and damn if they're in the script, handwritten note by him, great night last night, check out Wooderson. I read the script. He's got three scenes in it. I go work on these three scenes. I come back, I read for the director, Richard Linklater. I get the part. Holy sh! I got the part. Now, before you go to work on a film, you have to do what's called a makeup, hair, and wardrobe test for the director. So I get called to set one night. I am not supposed to work. This is a week and a half before my first day of shooting, but I'm gonna do a makeup hair and wardrobe test. I go through that, I come out, I'm standing on the curb, North Austin, the director, Richard Linklater, comes up, he starts snickering, he's going, yeah, this looks like Wooderson. I like the hair, I like the peach pants, I like the Ted Nugent t-shirt, great. And I said, all right, well, I'll see you in a week and a half. And he goes, oh, hang on a second. He goes, you think Wooderson would be interested in the redheaded intellectual girl? And I'm like, oh man, Wooderson likes all types of girls, man. You know? And he goes, he goes, well, Marissa Rabisi is the actress playing the redheaded intellectual over here. And she's in the car, kind of with her nerdy friends. It's Friday night. She's pulling through the top notch, getting a burger, wondering what to do for the night. Maybe Wooderson pulls up and tries to pick her up. And I'm like, okay. Next thing I know, I'm in this car seat getting a lavalier mic hooked up, and we're about to shoot a scene where my character Wooderson pulls up to try and pick up the redheaded intellectual, and there's not a word written. Oh my I God. start getting a little anxious. Yeah. Never acted before in my life, never done any of this, but I start to tell myself, Matthew, who's your man? Who's Wooderson? And I'm going through my mind, and I said, well, Wooderson's about his car. I go, well, look at here. I'm in my 1970 Chevelle. There's one. I go, Wooderson's about rock and roll. I said, well, man, I got Ted Nugent Stranglehold in the eight track right now. There's two. I said, Wooderson's about getting high. And I said, well, Slater's riding shotgun. He's always got a doobie rolled up. There's three. And all of a sudden I hear, action. And as I look up, across the parking lot at the redheaded intellectual, played by Marissa Rabisi, I said, and Wooderson's about picking up chicks. Put it into drive, pull out. And verbally, I was giving an affirmation of the three things I had while going to get the fourth. I said, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> and that was the three affirmations for the three things I had. Oh, okay. My car, rock and roll, and weed, while I was trying to go get the fourth thing that my character Wooderson wanted. That is crazy. Did you use the words all right normally in your vocabulary? No, or was it no, it contextual? was um, if I remember a couple months before that, there was a live performance of the doors. I think it was over in Amsterdam or something. And Jim Morrison in between songs like barked, all right, all right, all right, all right. He said it four times, really a barking aggressive level. And for whatever reason, that meter and that came into my head and I think I took that and made it Wooderson's in a much more laid back, all right yeah. way. When that happens, do you know it's right or it only in retrospect will you say, I feel really good about that. So that was a kickoff. Mind you, I'm about to right. go into the scene that we go improvise. And I sit there and go, hey, what's happening? You ought to ditch the geeks in the back. We got a fiesta in the making tonight, blah, blah, blah. All this bullshit she's just riffing on, right? But those three were my kickstart into my first yes. scene of my career yes. to give me the confidence and the sense of identity of who my man was, Wooderson. I didn't know if it was like, 
good or what. It was a it was a trigger for me that I gave myself to. Here's how I'm coming into the scene. Wooderson's a guy who's rolling. He thinks he's living in the salad days. He thinks that the world's his oyster. He thinks Friday night's the best night in the world, and he likes doing what he does. And he's gonna go pick up a new chick, man. And he's, and he's so it was a it was a confidence sort of a trigger word. A I phrase see. that got me into the scene. I didn't know if it was any good. I wasn't really judging it. It was just what I needed, which is what Wooderson needed, where I thought Wooderson would be going into that scene. Oh, that's fascinating. If you want to be that character, you have to give yourself permission. Permission. Um, and like anything, I think not just characters in movies, but in, in, in life, entrances and exits. When you're going into something, you got to think of where you're coming from. You don't walk into it and then go action and then kind of start up. You walk into frame, where are you coming from? Are you coming from a win? Are you coming from a loss? Are you coming from pain? Are you coming from success? Are you confident? Are you insecure? So it matter, It had, does have something to your walk, to your talk, whether you're turning up a shoulder, huh? Whether you're looking someone in the eye, how your shoulders back, is your heart high, is your, is your waist forward, is your waist back? It has to do with Diction and, and movement, where you're coming from and where you're going. Entrances and exits are very important. And growing up, did you have someone who you looked up to or someone who was fundamental in who you are? Well, I had my brother, Pat, who actually the character of Wooderson was based on. This is a really, another really cool story. So the brother that should have had all the stories... But all the good stories were about. The radical one, Pat. Yeah, yeah this <laughs> I guy. I got it. Pat was my hero. I was 11. He was 17. And he was cool to me. we do these skits all the time. He'd be Friday night about to go on a date. You remember that old uh, uh, shampoo called Gee, Your Hair Smells Terrific? Yes, of course. Yeah. So Pat, would, Pat had long hair, and he was kind of an athlete, ladies' man. And we had a little skit we'd do before he got on Friday night. He'd come out of the shower wrapped in his towel, and we'd walk in the kitchen, and he'd kind of stand there, and I'd kind of act like I walked him and go, Hey, what's up, Pat? And he'd go, what's up, little brother? And I'd go, dang, you smell good. And he'd whoop, he'd whip that bottle out in front of me. He goes, gee, my hair smells terrific. <laughs> so we had skits we'd do, right? And he'd flick his hair. Well, anyway, 1986, he's 17, I'm 11. His car broke down, was in the shop. He had a, he had what a, kind of he, car do you have? Oh, I have this, to ask. Yeah, right. 81 Z28. Nice. T tops. Concord now, in stages. Texas, that is, that is like, that's a Lamborghini. Oh, at least. <laughs> at <laughs> least. So his car was in the shop. We had to pick him up, and I was in the back of the station wagon. And we drove through the school after school looking for him and couldn't find him. As we get past, about to leave the school. She mom's going, where is he? I'm in the back looking at the back window of the station wagon. And I see this silhouette about 150 yards away of this dude, cooler than James Dean, leaning against a brick wall, one leg up, on boot up on the wall, and a lazy finger here that I knew with a little glow on the end. I knew it was a cigarette. Lazy handed cigarette hanging here. And as I went to go, there he is. It hit me. Oh, He's going to get in trouble for smoking. I can't say that to him. Right. So I didn't say anything. Right. But that image from 150 yards away of my big brother, who looked 10 feet tall, leaning back in the smoking section with a lazy two-fingered cigarette in his hand, was Wooderson. Now, was that really Wooderson? Was my oh. brother Wooderson? No, but it, through my 11-year-old eyes, he yeah. was. Podcast is, of course, meaning amazing people like you make our lives better every day. But it's also about reawakening the emotional human experience of cars and trips and yeah. because there's so much technology now and a lot of trips are pretty boring but there are a lot of magical things that happen around cars and with people and and that's really what this is about so i have to ask you about your trip in europe with the motorcycles yeah. because i love motorcycle people there's no airs there's nothing fit like and you're exposed and but this trip sounds so much fun uh, that you took with your friends. And like, how did it work out? And what what got you to the point where you're like, let's travel around Europe and motorcycle on motorcycles? So I'm in Hollywood sleeping on the couch of that same guy, Don Phillips. Okay. That yep. cast me back a year ago, right? And I'd driven yep. out to Hollywood a year later with my U-Haul and 2,000 bucks and frozen loaves of bread. And I'm sleeping on his couch. <laughs> And I'm getting below a thousand dollars, 
in my savings and I'm like getting a little nervous and I'm like, go to Don one night and I go, Don, I, can you help me, man? I need to, I need to meet a, an agent. I got to get a job. And he snapped at me. You don't need to meet an agent. You don't need an MF in job. What you need to do is relax. This town smells somebody who's needy, especially somebody who wanted to be an actor. They'll throw you out like that. What you need to do is go off with your buddies. Rory and Cole, I don't know. Go, go, go ride somewhere. Go to Europe. Go somewhere. Get the hell out of here. And quit thinking about needing an agent or needing a damn job. You just go be you. Forget about it. That'll come. Wow. So I took what little money I had. Me and my buddies Cole and Rory got our backpacks. We got tickets, coach tickets, and I filled out on a, on a cheaper airline to Amsterdam with return ticket, I think, like 20-something days later. Amsterdam, fun place to land. Stayed in the hostel a couple <laughs> nights. And then went looking for motorcycles. And the nearest motorcycle place we found was this really nice place in, in Rosenheim, Germany. We caught a ride there, show up in Rosenheim. We go in. It's got a beautiful bike shop just outside. It was in the country, big out of everything. We go in, and he was really interested in these three young American men who wanted to ride. It just turned him on. You could tell he had done it. He was like, ah, oh, yes. He loved that three young men from America were coming to ask for motorcycles to tour his country and tour Europe. And he was showing us everything. And we weren't playing our hand about how much money we had or didn't have. We just, and we ended up going, he was like, this is the bike. Which bikes do you want? And we were like, well, this, this, this. He goes, well, that's the bike you need. And they were all nice, really nice bikes. Rory got like a Ducati, I don't know, huge mansion. Other buddy Cole got a big Kawasaki, like 1,000 or 1,200 or something. I, because I grew up on dirt bikes, Ended up getting like a BMW 450. It was an Enduro. I had an idea that I was going to yep. be off-road a little bit. Okay. This turned out to be- Those are did. three very different choices. Very different. And I would say if I w w did it again, I would not get the same bike I got. Didn't have near enough weight or horsepower. As we go to uh, go, well, that's great. Then we said, well, what's it going to cost? And he pulled the bill and it was- extraordinarily much more than we we had on us and we we're like oh man we can't do that all i got is i got this couple hundred dollars here and he had a wife who was evidently knew that he had a generous heart and he knew that he was taking affection to these three young men doing what he okay was she do. there like oh yeah she was there <laughs> she's watching her husband yoan nodding her head going uh-uh like, no, they're going to take the motorcycles. They oh, come I back. see. And, and they don't have the back. money. Yeah. There's no insurance. You don't have ID. Da, da, da. And he's like, no, I know what they want to do. We're like, look, here's our return tickets. We got to get home. This is a guarantee. We'll be back. She's like, no, no, no. <laughs> he cuts it off and he goes, no, I have to. And he rolls. He gets up, rolls those bikes out, makes sure they're full of gas. She's about standing back up there. I remember as we all got on the bikes and said, see, he goes, go have a great time on the road. So, boom, we head off. <laughs> Having a great time, man. Staying in a hostel here, staying in a hostel there. And it was somewhere in southern Italy that Rory, my buddy with the Ducati, who was usually ahead of us, doing 160, he laid the Ducati down on an off-ramp yeah. into an open field, one of those fields you have that separate you know, the, the highway from the off-ramp. And he was injured, but not hospital injured. He had some magical leather pants on that saved his ass, but the bike was the bike was totaled. Once we find out he's okay, we find a phone, we call Johan, and Rory says, I totaled the Ducati. And the first thing he says was, are you okay? Are you okay? Wow. And Rory's like, yeah, wow. I, skimmed, I skimmed my leg up, I'm good. Sorry about the bike. He goes, what's your location? We told him, ramp 405, blah, 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 blah. He goes, okay, I'll have a truck there tomorrow to pick up the bike, 11 a.m. Geez, wow. Okay, the guy's going to pick up the bike. We go to that field where that total bike's sitting there. The next morning at 11, and up pulls this big van. Drives off, gets in the field, pulls up. <laughs> Driver gets out. Johan came, gets out of the driver's seat, gets no out. No way. And as we go, starting the I'm sorry's, and the bike's totaled, he looks at it. He glances at it. Before he even goes to pick up the bike, he, he and the guy go to the back of the van, raise the door, step up in it, and guess what they roll out? 
a motorcycle. brand new Ducati. No way. The same, Why? the same make. Like, that's crazy. Rolls it out, puts it on the kickstand, gets the totaled one up, puts it back in the van, hands him the keys, and goes, "Keep riding, my friend. Keep riding." Oh my god, that's amazing. So we and rode. So, we rode another two and a half weeks and returned to Johan. He like get, he's got to be a friend for life. Ah, oh, he was a minch, man. What a minch. He handed wow. us back those plane tickets. Didn't ask for a dollar more. Just wanted, sat there and just tell me the stories. Tell me your stories. Tell me your stories of the ride. We walked around any, for three were hours. Were any good stories? There were all kinds of great stories. So, you know, right. I mean, it, so we shared wild nights. We shared pulling over and swimming in rivers on the side in Austria and Germany mm. and, and nights in Rimini until 7 a.m. And he loved it all. <laughs> <laughs> oh that is awesome yeah what a great experience and so when you got back to la like what what happened did it work did the advice it did i'm back on don's couch i yeah. hadn't thought about acting or getting an agent for a right. month i'm free as a bird man i'm rolling yes. telling you this is such a great <laughs> time da, 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 da. that night we're having dinner. Me and Don would have steak. He'd have a little, he'd always make a little filet mignon. And then he'd have one scoop of haagen vanilla ice cream with the cherry on top and a little maraschino sauce. And he would call it the piece de la resistance. And as he was making us that, that little bowl of haagen and putting the piece on it, he sat it down. He goes, you're ready. And I go, for what? He goes, tomorrow morning. I got us a meeting, 9 a.m. William Morris. Brian Gersh, William, uh, Beth Holden. They've seen Days of Confused, your movie that I cast you in. They like it, but it's a smaller part. They want to meet you, maybe to represent you. I said, let's go. Holy smoke. <laughs> and I went, and instead of me going in needy, like, which I would have been yeah. if I'd have gone in early, yeah, I'd have been like, you man, I'm, I'm, I'm down trip. to 600 bucks. I need it. I sat back. It was respectful, but cool. Talked about who I was. Talked about who I wasn't. Talked about my experience on Days, things I want to do. Bam. We want to represent you. The first two auditions I got, one a week later, the one I got a week later was for a film, Boys on the Side. I got called back to meet with the director and I got the role. The second audition I had, Angels in the Outfield, I got it. The first two auditions I had in Hollywood, I got the, I got the role. Holy smokes. So he was right in retrospect. I mean, he was totally right. I learned from him. Play your game in the business of Hollywood. Don't do your business in the game of Hollywood. I see, I see. And so you're very much a Texan. <laughs> At Ford, we sell so many F-150s in Texas. Yes. Did you ever go on the dark side, like not have a truck and then regret it? <laughs> yes, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I sure did. I had a truck, and as I said, I used to customize. And one of the customized things I had in my truck was I had a loudspeaker I put in the front grill. So on my CB inside, I could be in the school parking lot and say 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 something like, "Oh, look at Kathy <laughs> Cook, what a nice, you know, whatever." And I go, and they'd all somehow look that totally Where's, doesn't surprise me. You know? And it was fun because yeah. and then Saturday night you could be at a party, you could go get in the truck, and I'd sit there and go, uh, "This is a uh, uh, Longview Police Department. Uh, is uh, Kevin Be <laughs> Kevin Spencer here?" And it'd be Kevin's house. I'd be like, "Kevin, the cops are here!" And I get it and come out, and I'd be like, "And I, I had yeah, all that stuff. It was so much fun." Anyway, I would also be the guy after school in East Texas. You get those rains. We had all those creek beds. I would go mudding. We'd go find yeah. a creek and we go out and field mud yep. and. Man, it was fun. My friends loved to come with me. The girls loved to come with me, whether it was friends with them. We were always fun. I was fun. I was a truck guy. I was the same guy that when we went to the concert, even if we were late, stick with me. Right. We're going to work our way to the front row right through the crowd, man. <laughs> you know, I was, it, it was a hustler in that yep. sense. And that, that was, I was, a, I was a truck guy. I drove by this Nissan dealership one night and I saw this cherry red T top. 300 ZX up on a stand, this price sticker on it. And I was like, whoa, 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 look at that. I pulled in and talked to the guy and son of a gun. I mean, my truck was used and muddy, but he offered a straight trade and I did it. So no money exchange. You get the new sports car and I, your truck. Boom. Your, it, With they mud your and truck. everything on it. Let's go. Great. Now, what do I notice the very next day? I get home, I wax it, it's perfectly clean. This thing is mint. 
got Are you in like tops. high school? In high school. I'm like junior year. High school. Year. Okay. That okay. matters. That matters a lot. It matters a lot. Yeah. So what did I do the next day? I go to school. Did I pull into the first parking lot where all my friends were so I could get on the speaker and make fun and jack with and flirt with? And No, no, no. I got my candy red sports car. I'm parking in the third parking lot because I don't want anybody opening any doors and touching my car. Everyone oh, stay I away. see. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be perfect. Now I'm becoming the guy that instead of working your way up and hustling to the front row of the concert, I'm that guy that's now leaning against the wall, smoking a cigarette, trying to look cool, but not on the dance floor. Follow? Right, right, So I'm right. in the third parking lot. And all of a sudden, I'm getting out of my car so fine, I noticed that, I'm kind of getting out of my car in the morning and leaning against it. Like, look at me and my fine red sports car. Uh -huh. So much so that it became like, look at my fine red sports car and oh yeah, look at me leaning on it. Now, I'm letting that sports car do all the work for me, or at least I think I am. I'm letting right. it try to average, and I think I am Joe Cool. After school, <laughs> not do you want to go mudding, do you want to cruise with me in my red sports mm. car T-tops down? That didn't last long. My friends didn't want to hang with me as much. The girls didn't right. want to hang with me as much. They thought it was I was boring. What did you do? This is a big dilemma. I said it was a big dilemma. Things dried up on me. And I realized, <laughs> thankfully, I was like, when did, did I, when did I hit this cold spell socially? The night I got this red sports car. I drove down to that Nissan dealership the next day. And I'd had this thing for about a month. And I went to that same guy and I said, will you please give me my truck please. back? I go, I screwed up. I screwed up, man. This thing's ruining my life. <laughs> and he son of a gun. I had to pay, I paid him like 400 bucks and he gave me the truck back. He hadn't sold it. I showed up the next day, front parking lot. Hey, look at Kathy. Look, oh, everyone was laughing. He's we were mudding that afternoon. I was back. I was like, whoo. I dodged the bullet, man. I relented. The, the, the. Oh. And I've had, oh, look, I use that red sports car as a metaphor, you know. In life, we all have certain red sports cars in our life that we we need to watch. You know, we get caught looking in the mirror. We get most popular. Yeah. We 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 start look. We get successful. We we get too objective about ourselves. We get overly aware of ourselves, and we keep being the subject in our own life. And that could be a recipe for some failure. Boy, is that great insight? The reason that resonates with me on many levels is because it's the head of Ford. When I got the job, I had to make some decisions. And one of them was like, what do we do with our strategy as a company? And I, I had an idea and it came totally natural, just like what you said, which is like, why don't we just do what we do really well and stop doing things that we aren't really good at. And we do pickup trucks freaking better yeah, than yeah. anyone in the world. Yeah. And why don't we just double down on Mustang and Bronco and pickup trucks and Super Duty and yeah. and work vehicles like vans and stop doing commodity SUVs that no one cares about? I mean, I've had times where I've been on road trips in my F450 and got home and slept in the back seat of my truck because I felt more comfortable than going inside my house into my bed. And I needed, I needed, even though I was in my driveway, yep. I had gotten so accustomed to the the Being feeling of the my truck. little domicile. Yep. That thing you were talking about just a second ago about doing one thing well. My buddy Roy Spence, his mother had always told him, hey, go be, go try and be great at what you're good at instead of good at what you're bad at. Every time I go work with someone, a director or someone I have real, such reverence for, they're masters at their craft. I'm always looking for the magic trick. Yeah. They never have one. They just do what they, they know who they are. They know their perspective and they do that really, really, really well. And yet we want to keep our eye open and be aware for innovations and where's the world going? And no, we don't chase every fad, but where's it going? Can we anticipate? Can we be ahead of the curve and be there when the demand, can we have the supply when the demand is, but doing what you're good at, being great at what you're good at. It's not necessarily you change by staying the same, but it's like double down on our strengths. You know, I yes. tell people this all the time when you talk exactly. to kids, kids talk to me. I'm like, well, what should I do? I'm like, well, one thing, what are you good at? What's yes. an innate ability, a God-given ability yes. you have? Okay, they yes. name it. Now, are you willing to work hard at that? Get educated, hustle, do what you can to do that. Do that. Don't think of an aberration or a bright idea. You right. know, someone always asks me, what's your dream? I said, like, well, I, I want to play basketball. I want to dunk. I'm 5'11", three quarters. My waistline's wider than the length of my legs. I was never going to dunk.
that's a good dream to pass on, McConaughey. <laughs> let's, just, let's, yeah. <laughs> let's not chase that one down. I don't have the innate ability for it. But knowing yeah. what you got the innate ability for, what you got the talent for, and doubling down on that and being great at that is a great way to go forward, as you're saying. I think so. Thank you. I know we don't have much time left. I ask this question to everyone, and especially you, because you've done such amazing things for our employees and for our customers. Um, do you have any piece of advice for me as a head of the company? By design and on purpose, good luck. <laughs> well, tell me more. Look, like we say, like, you know, you get, we get plans and you just mentioned one and I followed up on it. You know, let's be good at, let's be great at what we're good at. That's a North Star. That's a pathway. There's room to swerve on those lanes to getting there for new ideas. Sure. Is there times to get yeah. off the feeder road about, hey man, this is coming. I think we should bet on this. Sticking to a core plan and following that compass, that's the by design and on purpose part. And then the good I luck is sometimes things are done unto us. The yes. world changes, something happens in economics, something happens in product, and you go, do I pivot here? You know, do we make an amendment to our, our yeah. central focus, our left lane we're in and where we're going, our North Star? But to pick that direction as leaders and it, it even as livers, it's okay for life to be a 16 lane highway and us to have room to swerve. Just know if we're going north, south, east, or west and stay in that direction and don't pull a Yui. It's okay totally. to swerve there, but stay in the same direction. Great advice because there's a lot of people saying, or electric vehicles are getting politicized, you know, like, well, oh, if you're a Republican, you can't buy an electric car. And I, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like if you drive a certain kind of way and you use the vehicle a certain kind of way and you know, you don't like going to gas stations, electric car is like an amazing, it's like better. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of pressures in a company like Ford to change direction. When things, when things get unclear, or right. as Bruce Hornsby would say, to feel the gray. And when the feel is gray, it's like, oh, you have to go left, you have to go right, especially in this world. It's like every, everyone wants a quick answer, right. you know, yes or no. And I guess I'm, I love what you just said because it would say to me, look, we should make adjustments. Maybe it'll go a little slower, but don't stop right. with your ambition to like blow people away with a vehicle could power your house for six days. Cause I can't do that with an internal wow. combustion engine. I'd love to. Cool. Uh, uh, well, thank you so much for your advice. I loved your input. I just enjoyed our conversation so I much. Too, I could talk to you for another six hours. I know it'd be easy too. You. It'd be easy too. Thanks for having me. And I sure yeah, enjoy it the myself. Best. Appreciate it. See you buddy. Drive is produced by Jesse Baker and Eric Newsom of Magnificent Noise. Our production staff includes Julia Natt, Eva Walchover, and Kristen Muller, with help from Lori Arpin, Krista Gentile, Max Owen Dunell, Catherine Sanders, Darnell Macon, and Mark Truby. Our host is Jim Farley, and this is Drive.